Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the Minivan Movie Club. I am accompanied by Nick Wiggum. And I'm Brett Gray. And I always say both of our names, so I just wanted to make sure I gave you time to speak your yeah, truth. Yeah, I didn't want to call myself the Bearded Boy Wonder this time, <laughs> so uh, maybe in the future that'll be the case, but not tonight. Yep. And speaking of the future, we've got a pretty awesome show about one of my favorite movies from the past. We're talking about Back to the Future. It is a rip-roaring ride of a movie. But before we get to those, we want to talk a little bit about some other things. The past couple weeks have been very busy with some of the movies that we've really loved. So this week, we want to make sure we get back to the basics and start the show off with a couple of streaming suggestions because it's important. And I told you, the, our, our segment for super simple streaming suggestions, for me, comes from the, that scene in The Notebook where Noah mm. is arguing, like, what do you want? What do you want? And I saw something on Facebook that just really reminded me of you. Oh. And uh, I thought, you had to see it. And uh, here's for your viewing pleasure. Enjoy. So what? So it's not going to be easy. It's going to be really hard. And we're going to have to work at this every day. But I want to do that because I want you. I want all of you. Forever, you and me, every day. <laughs> Will you do something for me? Please? You just picture your life for me? 30 years from now? 40 years from now? What's it look like? If it's with that guy, go. Go! I lost you once. I think I can do it again. I thought that's what you really wanted. But don't you take the easy way out. What easy way? There is no easy way! No matter what I do, somebody gets hurt! Would you stop thinking about what everyone wants? Stop thinking about what I want, what he wants, what your parents want. What do you want? What do you want? It's not that simple! What it do you want? Frog on it. What do you want? Frog on it. I have to go! Hmm. Sometimes negotiating with your partner can, can feel like that moment, so here are your streaming suggestions for the week. So my first super simple streaming suggestion for this week is Air, the story of Air Jordan. It just got released on Amazon Prime. So any of you Prime members, go check it out. Prime Video, Air. Uh, my first streaming suggestion for this week, keeping in tune with the theme of the Back to the Future trilogy, uh, go watch Terminator 1, 2, and 3 on HBO Max, soon to be Max. Uh, it's one of those all-time classic blockbusters. Go watch it. Uh as we head into the second streaming suggestion, I'm going to suggest that you guys go back and watch our breakdown of the movie Air. It is on YouTube. You can listen to it on Spotify. Uh, we actually did a double feature. If you don't want to hear about uh, Renfield, that's fine. You can skip past that that episode and hop into the the meat of the of the of the episode, which was our discussion of Air. Second streaming suggestion for me: another trilogy. Go watch the Jason Bourne trilogy, Supremacy, Identity, and Ultimatum. It is one of my favorite trilogies of all time. Terminator is really based off this like futuristic sci-fi. Back to the Future is more of a campy thriller, uh, you know, comedy, corny, cornball. Uh, the Bourne Ultimatum is, is very much based in this real spy world, and it is awesome. Uh, even if you've watched these movies already, they're all-timers, so go watch the Bourne trilogy. And I only had two streaming suggestions, so oh, I know you have a third. And for me, I have a trilogy, a trilogy, trilogy of trilogies. Trilogy of trilogies. Uh, once you watch those two, it's just announced today that the Indiana Jones trilogy, one through three, is coming to Disney+. Plus. And as you know, the new Indiana Jones movie is coming out in June. So go watch those three movies so that you're ready for that one. And I'm certain we're going to do an episode on it. Yep. So go ahead, put these all on your calendar. You don't have to be like Kermit and Miss Piggy. You don't have to fight no. over it. Just no. <laughs> that was really good. Forever, forever in the, yeah, forever in the future, <laughs> I'm always gonna hear that scene now through Kermit and Miss Piggy's <laughs> voice. So I appreciate that. And I never realized how much Kermit sounds like um John C. Riley yeah. in his cadence. Hey. But now now I'm always gonna hear that every time I see Step Brothers or Talladega Nights too. Yep, so yep. great yeah. movies in their own right. Yep. But the reason that we're talking this week about the, the bell of the ball, which is Back to the Future, is because last week we talked about Guardians of the Galaxy 3, Volume 3, and that led us to have a conversation about it, not only its significance inside the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but what its significance was amongst comic book trilogies and sci-fi trilogies and just all-time trilogies. It's a great one. Go back and watch that episode. If you haven't seen that movie, go watch it in theaters. It's it's incredible. 
but it made us think, what are some of the best all-time trilogies out there? You know, is it is it Lord of the Rings? Is it Jurassic Park? Terminator, the Bourne trilogy, The Matrix? There's so many amazing trilogies, and I don't know if you can rank a top one or two or three, but I think we can all agree on like a top ten list. Maybe we can debate about it. But on that top ten list for a lot of people is Back to the Future. Yep. Uh, you look at anybody's top ten list, it's so hard to stay consistent for three films uh, to keep that same quality. So many movies have just such a strong uh, first take, such a strong uh, intro to their universe, their world, uh, and then cash in and drastically there's a decline, uh, whether it's due to uh, pressure put on by the studio to to green light a sequel and get that out to the audience while the the fire's still hot or whether it's just due to like uh, a lack of creative diversity we had an idea for a first one and the studio pushed us into a second and a third uh, but these films that we're talking about tonight they don't have that problem yeah back to the future uh, it stays very consistent throughout I think that's a testament to much of the team staying together, the creative team, uh, the writers, director, producer, uh, and the two main actors. Uh, and so you get a vision that feels complete uh, throughout. There, I do have a favorite, and you know I, I do rank them inside of the trilogy itself as the episode goes on. But uh, overall, the quality is there, and that's what makes for a really fun and memorable trilogy. If you mention things like Terminator... Uh, I think everybody loves the first two, and then it's a pretty steep fall off with the third, or even Jurassic Park. It's like the first one's great, the second one, and the third one, you know, nobody really talks about. Uh, luckily, that these are three distinct stories that yep. have distinct backdrops that you instantly, as soon as you start watching the first one, you know you're watching the first one. Watching the second one, you know you're in the future, and then you watch the third one, you're in the Western. You know uh, from the jump where you're at. Yeah, and it's worth noting that for this movie, You've probably seen this movie, so we're not going to try to rehash the, the plot points. We're not going to go look at all the specific Easter eggs. Again, that's not what this channel is about. This channel is all about having fun discussions about the movies. And Back to the Future, obviously, is tied to some very Hollywood royalty names. Yep. Steven Spielberg, Robert Zemeckis, Bob Gale. That's kind of the, the, the trio of amazement that is leading these films. And there's no reason, there's no surprise to me that those three were able to make an awesome film. The idea of it comes from Bob Gale. He was cleaning out his father's like, attic, and he saw his father's yearbook, and he thought to himself, well, what would it have been like if he would have known his father? He saw that his father was like the class president, and he did not know that about his dad. And so he was like, well, would I have been friends with my dad like if he was like the class president? Because like, I wasn't the, that kind of guy. And yeah. Would I want to be his friend? Or like what happened to him along the way? And so that was kind of the the inception moment of like what that could be. Bob Gale, great writer, starts talking with Robert Zemeckis, just an all timer. Uh, movies like Cast Away, uh, Forrest Gump, just a really great uh, director. And they kind of brainchild this idea of what if we create a period piece that is surrounded by this really interesting time travel piece? And uh, it really creates a, a really fun movie that has kind of become indelibly a part of pop culture. And you've got the DeLorean, which, you know, for our generation, we weren't around when the uh, DeLorean Motor Company was around. So we weren't, no. we're not privy to that like it was in the 80s. But you've got moon boots, hoverboards. Uh, all kinds of Lego sets, the flux capacitor, the, the the clothing, the costumes, the music. There's just like these endless pop culture references inside of songs and movies, and it's kind of become just a staple of Hollywood. You look at the recent movie came out a few years ago, Ready Player One. Of there is so much of just pulled, not just references, but just straight up copy paste, Control V, Control P into the movie. So uh, I'm curious, like before we get deep into the trilogy. My takeaway was that it was just kind of this really campy and fun film that if you don't want to look too deeply on the surface, it's fun. It's got good jokes, good writing. It's funny. It's not trying to be too much. But then if you take a step back and you look on a deeper level, a more subversive note, there, there's a lot going on. Yeah, I, I think uh, 
as I said to you previously, it's almost like the uh, the Shrek of movies. <laughs> There's it's an onion with so many layers. There's layers. So you you have the surface layer, which is just this like fun, like you said, a fun campy movie, lots of like slapsticky humor. Uh, Christopher Lloyd and Michael J. Fox they pair so well together because they have really good comedic timing uh, that it can be just this like hoverboards and time machines and going back and meeting your dad and like the quirky funny interactions that you have with like your mom trying to kiss you and like uh, (laughs) just like this like goofy story that has time travel involved in it but it's not like a central plot of where uh, the whole focus is like we're making a time travel movie the time travel is the backdrop to like this story about family and all these other things. Uh, but then as you dive deeper and you rewatch, so if you love it as a kid and then you can rewatch it again as an adult and then you start to catch these like foreshadowing Easter eggs, uh, all these like subtle backdrop moments, these repeated motifs, uh, all these things. There's so many repeated visual things that you see throughout that they do that weave the story together that make for a really uh, complex storytelling device. But you don't have to dive that deep into it if you don't want to. You can just watch mm-hmm. it. It's a popcorn movie. You could throw it on. It's fun. It feels like a roller coaster. It feels like a summer blockbuster of like, man, this is just a fun ride of a movie. And then it can be like, all right, I'm on to the next thing. But it's so ingrained into our culture, into storytelling, and into movies that you almost never see a time travel movie that doesn't have some sort of reference yep. to either characters or um plot points or speaking points to Back to the Future. That's yeah. how, how it is. Back to the Future was one of my favorite trilogies as like a young boy, like probably eight or nine years old. I could watch this movie and understand it, and it seems so futuristic and out there. And now here I am 20 years later, you know, I'm, I'm 31, and I can watch this movie, and it takes on a totally different mindset because then I was thinking about what it would be like to meet my dad. Now I'm watching the movie like, I'm kind of in between those yeah. ages. I'm not. I'm not young enough to be Marty. I'm not old enough to be George. I'm kind of interested, like, in watching the trilogy. And I think something that was really interesting for me watching this movie was I watched the first, the second, the third, and three successive days. It reminded me of like when binging first started, oh, like yeah. watching House of Cards for the first time on Netflix. I just remember every. It wasn't like, hey, we're gonna pick up next week, where you have to pull me back into the show here it's every episode picks up exactly where it left off so the story just keeps going and going and going and this is part one part two part three it, it was a, a really fun story and i think that's where we should kind of start of talking about some of those motifs let's do this let's go through and break down uh part one then okay. part two and then part three so uh looking at my notes uh for part one um Movie opens up with Marty going to Doc's, uh, the Doc's house, blowing out the speaker, and then meeting up with his girlfriend Jennifer to go try out for the, the 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 the, the, the spring fling, the dance. I forget what it is. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting to think about there when he's talking to Jennifer, saying like, "I'll never get to play in front of anybody. Maybe I'm just not cut out for this." Like immediately. We're dealing with this like idea of rejection and identity where in a very simple movie, again, because this is all, you know, guys and like the power of love and skateboards and silly little montages. But immediately we're hit over the head with like, hey, dude, you're just too dang loud. Sorry, kid. You've got no future. And he's like, I don't I want to I want to play music, but it's not a big deal. I'm not going to play. And I just thought that was like really interesting that even like a very simple movie, that's one of the very minor themes there in this specific film. But throughout the entire series, they're constantly bringing up very su- subtle ways to talk about what could be like existential crisis moments, but it's just kind of really like a throwaway of, hey, we're going to set this up, and that starts to pay off later on in this specific movie. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the things that like make the first movie so good is that you see like the visual image, you see the repeated lines, dialogue of these things, like you're saying, like the the way that the the principal, I assume he's the principal or a vice yeah, principal, sure. the way that he like talks to Marty and then you like instantly when he goes back to the past, you get to see the same way he talks to his dad. Uh, he even mentions like you're going to be uh, like a pushover like your dad was his whole life. You're not going to be successful. And you see like those repeated things and then you get to see those moments as they pay off throughout the film 
really speak to like these identity crisis moments of, uh, well, Marty sees his dad as this pushover because th- from the beginning you see Biff kind of bullying his dad and then he goes back to the past and you see his dad's always been this way. And Marty thinks of himself as more of like a, uh, he's got more confidence. Like he wouldn't let anybody, more swagger. Push, he's, yeah. he wouldn't let anybody push him over. But then you see the, the fear where he's worried about performing and, putting himself out there with his music and you get to see that same fear that his dad had. Uh, and it speaks to one of the big themes, I think, especially the first movie is like, what are these things that we're like passing on to our kids right. as far as like these character flaws? We, we know that we try so hard to, to ingrain good traits into our kids, but undoubtedly, especially as they age, they start to see our weaknesses. Uh, and there are certain things that we just kind of pass on. And, and for him, that was that fear of creative rejection of like, what if I put myself out there and it, I'm not good enough? Or yeah. what if everybody well, it's funny. Up? Another episode that we did, uh, one of our very first episodes, and we have a ghost. Anthony Mackie has a great line in that movie where he talks about, like, he just wants to be a good father. And when you're a kid, it's easy to not notice those bad things. And then when you're an adult, you kind of see those things. And this movie, I think, is much more effective uh, in doing that in a very, like, easy way like it's, it doesn't beat you over the head with some like dark topics you can watch this movie and really enjoy it but then there are little subtle ways like from a writing perspective where they just masterfully do the Chekhov's gun you know principle where early on in the movie uh mom says like look we all make mistakes in life children uh we all do things and she talks like hey if grandpa hadn't hit your dad with his car none of y'all would have been born and that starts to pay off because the moment that Marty is back in the past and he gets hit by the car. If you look at the picture, they start fading. It's like priming us very immediately. Uh, it's like, hey, if this happens, and I, I love the part when uh, Lorraine's dad, Marty's actual grandfather, hits him. It's like, Stella, I hit another one of them kids with my car. And like on a rewatch, I was like, how many kids has this guy hit with his car? Like, but I'm thinking, well, because like the dad <laughs> has he hit George before? Well, it's like, like the dad's like a what's he going? Tom and like the daughter's changing. I'm like, so does everybody just know that she like changes with her window open <laughs> to like all these boys just like cycle through? Or maybe she does it on purpose. Like yeah. she's she's eliciting the, well, the attention when she's t- when she's dealing with Marty. She's very forward. So well, she said back at the kitchen table before back in 1985 of. Oh, Marty, I don't like that girl, Jennifer. J- girls shouldn't be calling boys and chasing oh, yeah. boys. I never did any of that. I didn't. And then we pay off later, like, you smoke? You drink? Oh, my gosh, who are you? Well, then that speaks to, like, like you were talking about with the, the creators – uh, seeing that stuff of his dad because yep, yep, yep. his mom was always like that was very like strict and like oh you shouldn't do this or never like this uh, and it speaks to a, another theme of like uh, I have a I have a uh, somebody I work with she's an older lady and she often talks about she grew up in the like the 50s and 60s and she often tells me she's like this world went to hell with the hippie movement uh, <laughs> and it makes me think of like these parents where it's like oh the 50s weren't they weren't like this like this was a, a good time but when you go back and you see like it wasn't really that good. Like Biff is a terrible person. The principal still is like awful to people. Uh, the mom wasn't like this like lady that she yeah, said she, she, she was partying. Good. Like, but through the lens of like looking through our past, it's like oh, we can look back and be like oh, like everything was great then. Yeah. See, I, I thought it was an uh, interesting thing talking about like the differences of times. This is really a a movie, especially nowadays, thirty five years after the the original release. Where now it's kind of like a period piece inside of a period piece Mm -hmm. where it's both a time capsule to the 1980s, but also to the 1950s. And what was really interesting is there, you know, Marty Calvin Klein is sitting at table with his mom, his grandmother, his grandfather, all of them just thinking he's Calvin Klein. And they're talking about like, hey, where's Riverside? Oh, Riverside's over there. It's off Maple. Like, oh, well, that's not this. That's JFK. And they're like, what he's like john f kennedy who's jfk (laughs) and they're like they have no idea who that is and they're just kind of a i thought that was like a really subtle reminder of how like a lot of people talk about jfk's you know rise to presidency like being a very visual you know uh presidential candidate and then his assassination that kind of period from 1959 to 1963 really being kind of the division between like this innocence of america the innocence of culture and that golden era of Mr. Sandman 1950s to Vietnam yeah. psychedelic 60s 
distrusting the government, distrusting your neighbor. And I thought that was kind of a really, again, very easy way to talk about a very big subject. Just make a joke. And it, 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 it paid off really well. And I really liked when they're talking about that part where, like, afterwards he, he being Marty, takes off and the grandfather tells Lorraine, he's an idiot. And, and it's all about his parents. It's all about his upbringing. He's got bad parents. Lorraine, if you ever raise a kid like that, I'll disown you. <laughs> it's like, if we ask the audience, that dramatic irony pays off so well. It's just great, great writing. Of like, you are talking to your daughter right now yeah. about her son that she's going to raise. And you're like the guy hitting people with your car. <laughs> and like, like rolling your TV in there to eat. But it, it's, I don't know, it, there's, what, and then his son is the one that goes to jail all the time, yep, right? Yep. He's like Uncle already behind Joey, bars. Uncle Joey. And, and then he's like always in jail. Uh, but no, I, I love that. I loved uh, the interaction. I think it's it's very under, I know a lot of people love uh, Crispin Glover and his portrayal of, of Marty's dad. I was shocked at how, how young they looked. Oh, yeah. Like, I, as a kid, I remember thinking everybody looks like an adult. They all, but watching this, especially Crispin Glover, this the practical effects for this movie. Let's give a lot of credit to like the timing of this movie. Even today, I think some of it still holds up really well because they said, "Let's do this very simply. Let's not try to be too CGI heavy or too difficult." I believed that Crispin Glover looked like a guy in his forties. Yeah, I know? believe he looked like. And, the then dad, and then when they show him young, I'm like, "Oh my gosh, that guy looks 17 years yeah. old." His like white pasty skin, his hair, his eyes, really, that on a rewatch was so much better than I thought it would be. Yeah, and, and seeing him like young, he he gives an awesome portrayal. Uh, but I think it's very understated. Uh, Tom Wilson, who plays Biff, he yeah. does such a good job of like being this like a obnoxious high school bully villain, and his dynamic with Marty of like. He's trying to he's trying to uh, be popular. He's trying to fit in, but he's not that smart. And like he always like says like his punchlines wrong or his sayings wrong. Um, but he just gives an awesome performance where it's yep. like even throughout the next two movies, uh, he betrays the the villain so well that it's like this like battle through time between him and Marty. Uh, that's just awesome to see pay out throughout. Well, it's a it's a motif that has been borrowed and played in other movies. There's other movies that did it before this one, but I think this movie really delivers. Where some things, it, it's okay to do like a very stereotypical thing if you deliver. Sometimes it doesn't have to be this totally brand new concept and it still be really valuable. Because if Biff isn't who Biff is in the first movie, which is a very cookie cutter villain. Of like, hey, we're going to put in this antagonist that's going to push the story forwards because they're a bad person. Well, in two and three... Biff's character changes pretty dra- dramatic, or dramatically, dramatically, Can't dramatically. Yeah, <laughs> that's like a, it changes. That's so a, much. Whole a whole new level. It's a whole word. new level of dramatically. Uh, but I think this movie did some really fun things of talking about like social commentary, where uh, you know, talking about uh, slang people use. Marty keeps saying like, "Oh, this is heavy, Doc. This is heavy." And I like when Doc's like. What what are, what are in, what why are, what's going on in the future that we're so concerned about the density of objects in the yeah, future? He's like, has the gravi- gravitational <laughs> pull on the Earth like, changed? What's going on, man? And I think that's a funny slang joke. Of I remember when I was a kid, I go, oh, "That's tight, that's tight." And my grandma would be like, "What's so tight in your world, huh? Yeah. What's so tight? You wear you wear baggy pants, or like we were like we were in third grade, like oh you got pwned." You got uh, pwned. Yeah, the pwned. Uh, I was like, oh you got oh you got pwned, buddy. I was so, like high school. I was like, bruh. Like, bra or like now bra, like bra. yit like people get lit oh yeah uh, yeet like every generation has their like words that are slang and so it's funny to hear them say things in the different parts of the movie like different squares or uh there was a part where uh i forget biff has some great insult or like that's so stupid but like that's actually kind of funny oh yeah well even like the that scene when they when he first goes back uh, and they're doing that chase around the square is just so fun. Like that's what that's what I think, like encapsulates like the just like the funness of this movie that makes it such like a a surface level yeah. watch is like that chase around like the goofiness of like the skateboard and then the crashing into manure. Well, uh, we're, we're not the first people to ever like talk about this, but Michael J. Fox wasn't the original person cast as Marty. Mm-hmm. He was the first choice, but he wasn't available because of his daytime shooting. So they had to do all that on sets. They shot the movie, like, I think it was like 50% done. 
And then they're like, this movie is taking on a much more serious tone with this actor, Eric Stoltz. So let's do it with Michael J. Fox. So all those pieces were done like on a universal lot. Yeah. And so that's why they were able to make it fun and easy because everyone else knew exactly what to do because they rehearsed it all day. And then uh, during the night when Marty or when Michael J. Fox would come over and shoot, they would be good to go, ready to go. And I and we one of our big criteria when we grade movies is that directorial vision. So I have to give the director props on that for having a guy cast, filming several things, and then just being like, this isn't my vision. This isn't what I want. Yeah. Uh, and stick into that conviction, the, the writing uh, and the, the picture for what the story should be. Because obviously it turns out amazingly. If we had like... Uh, if we had another movie that was like going through this much turbulence, like before we ever saw it, we'd be like, "This movie's gonna suck." Like, yep. look at all the problems it's having. Uh, oh no, Batwoman what, or well, Batgirl. Not, I think it's like, it's like the Flash, like all the problems they had. So it's like, but then you're already starting to hear some rumblings of like people really like it. So then it's like, is it gonna be kind of like a Back to the Future where it has all this production issue, but then we get like a great movie, hopefully. But back on to Back to the Future. Well, uh, on the the note of giving credit to like Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale, Steven Spielberg. Another person we've got to give some credit to is like Alan Silvestri. Uh, he's the musical composer for the movie. Oh, yes. The score is just like iconic. That like it is so iconic and just it's almost inspiring. I think it's worth noting like he's done so many big movies. Forrest Gump, Cast Away. Uh, he did James Cameron's The Abyss. He's done like four of the movies from the MCU. Yeah, he did uh, the main theme of the MCU. Yeah, he's done The Avengers, Infinity War, Endgame, Captain America: Civil uh, Civil War, or uh, Captain America: The First Avenger, and all those themes have been like reprised. So, what's cool is in those movies, which are very different movies, like Castaway, is a very emotional movie. Uh, Endgame has some like really emotional scores and. So this movie, while it's meant to be kind of this like campy summer blockbuster popcorn movie, the musical score does so, so much to help ground the emotional narrative and like the stakes. So that like when we're having these conversations about like all oh, the nineteen fifties and your mom being kind of maybe a little bit more of a floozy than she's you know laid on, your dad being far more of a nerd than he laid on, like yeah. all these things that are kind of funny. We start to think in the music of like, is our future decided for us or can we change our fate? Which is like a really big philosophical discussion, a big debate to have that this movie and the whole trilogy speaks to. Are you in control or is someone else? What, what, what's, what decides your fate? And I think the music does a great deal for having that discussion because... There are times where we get to see Marty's reaction or Doc's reaction or some character's reaction and the musical score leads us in a way to have our own thought where the writers don't have to tell us everything. The music yep. tells us certain things too. Yeah, it conveys that emotion perfectly. Uh, and I think if it had been made now and they were like, oh, we're going to set this in the 80s and then go to the 50s, we would have probably just been pumped full of like corny 80s songs and yeah. it's like having that original score with just a few uh time songs like uh mr sandman when they yep. get to the 50s or uh chuck berry or uh you know van halen like i think it plays perfectly of like a blending yep. of those two things and as a good good place for like using some original score we've talked about it with mario go check that episode out we've talked about it with air go check that episode out where it feels like sometimes the music can kind of take you a little bit out of the moment. And this score is is, is really good. And especially at the end of this movie, like the big climax between Marty and Doc. It's really not a very interesting scene to watch, but because of the score, it, it really brings the intensity up. We're just watching two guys talk. Yep. Uh, but the, the, the score does and the wind a and tremendous the amount. It like yeah. all adds to that final product of the, the final climax. Yep, so... The story of the first one, you know, Marty is stuck in 1955. He has ruined the timeline by getting hit by the car. He's got to get his parents to fall in love at the Enchanted Under the Sea dance so that he can go back to the future and him be alive, his brother alive, his sister alive, all that hoopla. Uh, and I think he has his, Marty has his plan to coach George up. They have some really good banter. And obviously there's the, the big moment where, He's in the car, 
Biff pulls him out, wants to fight Calvin Klein, and then unbeknownst, George is thinking he's going to walk up to the car and fight Calvin, but turns out it's actually Biff. Biff grabs George, embarrasses him, and I didn't know this, uh, but uh, on first watch, but then after having heard this and then looking for it, uh, kind of a cool thing that George is left-handed. Uh, oh, yeah. So when he like tries to punch because of the way that Marty told him to do it, uh, he gets denied. Uh, but then as he's sitting there being like mocked and ridiculed, he reaches back with his left hand and just clobbers him. And I think that's a really cool moment. One, because a big part of like the entire trilogy is Marty's meddling. He gets too emotionally involved or invested in like he's trying to make things right, but he just makes things worse. Yep. Uh, however, it seems like he goes down this like series of bad choices that just make one thing kind of snowballs out of control. And then somewhere at the very end of it, some big thing happens. So when George, boom, knocks him up, uh, are you okay? And he reaches down to Lorraine. This is the moment that changes George's life. Because in the future of this movie, we know he's now a confident writer. He's not ridiculed by Biff. He calls him on his bluff. That is the moment that changes George's life is, are you okay? Because Lorraine is now spared the trauma of possibly being sexually assaulted by Biff, but also she sees this guy as like, oh, this guy is willing to take care of me. Moreover, everybody at the dance is like, who is that? Like, oh, that's George McFly. Yep. Oh, he he did that. He, he laid out Biff. Oh, my God. Oh, my. George. Hey, George, good job, yeah, buddy. He stood up to the school Like, bully. all of a sudden, George is cool. So he's got the confidence now, and we see that. But I thought it was really interesting that uh, immediately, Marty's like, the kiss. They got a kiss. He sees his picture because nothing's changed. The kiss later on, that's the moment that Marty's life changes. Yeah. Uh, so I thought it was really, really interesting when you think about, like, all the things that were primed up in the very first movie of, hey, if your father didn't hit, if you, if uh, my grandfather didn't hit your dad with his car, none of you have been born. Uh, so for now, it's the flip side where now your dad hit Biff up against a car. And that's why you're you're, you're going to be born. Um, then you tie into the fact that now Morty's getting his opportunity to play on stage with Marvin Berry. He's got his stage fright. And as a kid, I thought that was him just being like scared or like disappearing. But now I'm realizing that was kind of a meta narrative of yeah. He finally gets to be on stage, and he's like, I don't know how to play a G chord. I can't. I can't do this. He's freezing up a little bit. Yep. Got that the the jitters that live performance jitters, and then he again. Uh, it's something that'll be a, a theme throughout this the series as his pride kind of takes over. He's like riffing on, and uh, everybody was drawn in when he's just playing the song. But then when he goes overboard, everybody's like, "Yo, what are you doing?" And, yep. Uh, we get the iconic, uh, "You guys aren't ready for this yet, but your, your kids, kids are gonna love it. They're gonna love it." Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, an all timer. Uh, and then we we hop into the end. Uh, he gets, you know, spoiler alert. He goes back to the future, back to his timeline. Uh, and we think, okay, everything's good. He's got the, the truck he always wanted. He's got the girl. His yep. parents have some money. Uh, and then here comes Doc to let right him know that. Right back in. Well, uh, I, so I thought it was really interesting, you know, before as he's like, right before Marty goes back to 1985, the car won't start. And that's kind of a payoff to, like, the, the DeLorean being, like, historically unreliable. This crappy machine. My dad was alive, obviously, during all of this. And he just tells me all the time how... They would never do this. They wouldn't. This is unrealistic because a DeLorean's a, you can't even change their oil. Like they're, they're unreliable. You can't do this. You can't do that. There are so many problems. And so my dad says he thinks it's so funny. That like, yep, that's a nod to the audience that this car is unreliable. This car sucks. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I thought that was, that was really funny. There's a theory that like the reason it won't start in those moments is because it's protecting himself from a paradox. Oh, like yeah, the, yeah. The, the, Somehow the DeLorean is sentient and has like its own character. And I don't know if I believe that, but I think it's that's kind of cool. I think it's one of those things, like, if the director ever says that's what he was going for now, then it's like he's just trying to take credit for stuff he didn't yeah. ever think of. So he gets, yep, and then he gets to the, fu Marty gets back to the future, and he's got, like, all this new things. Like, the furniture is different. His siblings have different jobs, different social status. Uh, the parents are in love. Which we didn't see before. Yeah, they're active. They're they're flirtatious. Uh, the mom likes Jennifer now. 
They're in uh, good shape. Uh, Mom's Biff is a simp. Yeah. <laughs> like, so many things have changed. And again, that is all not from the punch. That's from the kiss. Yeah. Uh, and I think it, it's cool to hear da- the dad say, like, like I've always told you, if you put your mind to it, you can do anything. And I think that's really funny. Really good writing. Part of the, the theme to that I took away from this specific movie is that is something that Doc Brown told Marty. That's something that Marty tells George, his father, when he's in 1955. And it's something that he like built his life around. So in the first half of the movie, Marty really doesn't like like his dad or he kind of looks at him like, oh, he's just kind of a nerd. Don't, don't do such a pushover, dad. Don't do that. Yeah. So he's like, I got to coach him. I, I, I know what I got to do. And then now his father's come full circle where he can be the father figure that he needs, that Marty needs. So in a sense, I think that in this movie, you know, Doc Brown is the father figure that Marty always wanted, uh, that he wanted his father to be. And through sharing that wisdom that Marty, uh, the Doc gave Marty, Marty gives that opportunity for George to be the, the father that he wants him to be. Yeah, it's clear that uh, we all have like multiple parent figures in our life that have like kind of stepped up. Uh, outside of our, you know, biological parents, but his, his relationship with an older gentleman, Doc Brown, uh, didn't seem that weird when you watch this movie as a kid. But as an adult, it's kind of like, why is this like, you know, seventeen year old hanging out with like a forty year old failed? I have a thought physicist. on that, by the way. We'll get to that. Uh, but like you said, he was longing for guidance for that fog, and so like, and if your dad was the George McFly of of 1985, Part One, yeah. It understands like, yeah, I'm, this guy's a loser. Like, I, he's yeah. getting pushed over by all the people. I'm, it makes sense. And here's here's Doc, who's like unashamedly himself. Like, even though everybody thinks he's like this crazy guy, like to to Marty, that's like an attractive quality to have in a, yep. in a father figure and a mentor. Uh, and so he gets to you know follow that role, and then it comes full circle, like you say. So that's awesome to see and great writing, and it's what makes the movie so rewatchable. Because then, yep. then you can go back and watch it with through that lens. It's like, also worth noting this movie. It, stands alone on its own like it, it has yeah. a kind of a beginning middle end it, it fits i think the other two part one, part two and part three really start to speak to like the trilogy and the story that's going on amongst the entire trilogy but three closing thoughts and let's jump into two one uh i don't know let me talk about this but i think that the actress played jennifer she's a babe oh yeah like usually i watch older movies i'm like oh, i can't get in like yeah showing me this person i'm like this is person is not attractive to me I'm like oh she's a babe yeah, like, it was, I, like way too hot for Marty McFly, who like doesn't have any friends, and his best friend is a doctor, who is a crazy scientist. Couldn't believe that part. I was like, oh, she's a babe. Second thing is, at the right at the very end, Doc shows up and says, like, "Marty, Marty, we gotta get to, we gotta go to the future." He's like, "What? Are we, what do we become assholes? Yeah. No, it's your kids, Marty, your kids." Uh, <laughs> and I think it again speaks to the theme that we've heard in the first part of this trilogy, which is family and legacy. Uh, but also speaking like perspective and empathy, which becomes a big part of the second movie and really a, a huge crux to the entire film. And then lastly, this is very important because I'm going to talk about this in a bit, but in this movie, Doc says the word precisely a lot. And it really sets up his character that is very concerned about doing like the right thing at the right time because he recognizes as a man of science that doing the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. Yeah. Uh, very concerned about the space-time continuum and paradoxes. And I just think it's very interesting to note how much he says the word precisely to really speak to that character because I think it, it, it sets up a big payoff later on in the trilogy. Well, I think he also betrays that character of like, what he's doing, he's doing for science and for research and for like the love of knowledge expansion but the fact that like he quickly realizes the danger of like the thing he's created, which was never his intention to use it because you'll see it as we go into the next movie, but like he didn't use it to have for financial gains. He didn't use it for power. He didn't use it. He was purely just wanted to explore uh, and study, uh, but he quickly realizes that it can be, you know, turned into something that's much more uh, harmful to the the greater society. So so that leads us to back to the future part two, where a big theme of this movie is pride. Yeah. Uh, a big part of this is the pride and like the concern and obsession with one's legacy, what their house is going to be like, what their life is going to be like. And hey, let's go back and make some make some bets. And the infamous Gray's Sports Almanac, uh, no relation uh, that I know of I wish from that 2015. You had all that knowledge. Uh, but 
you know, it says like over and over and over again, like doing the right thing versus doing what you what is you're supposed to do. You know, chicken, what's wrong with your chicken? You, you, you yellow belly, all these different things. Uh, and ironically, like the whole plot of this movie, like going to the year 2015, which we've lived through, look nothing like that. No hover cars, no hoverboards. Uh, the whole plot could have been avoided if they would have just locked the DeLorean. And not that they just locked it, like literally they just left the door open so that old Biff could just get in and fly away and fly yeah. back. Like they didn't even shut the door. <laughs> they just parked it. Like, the, they the park it and it, like I was thing. watching, I was like, are they going to, did they just leave the door unlocked? It's like, no, they left the door open. And the keys in there and everything else. No, if that happened in my neighborhood, it'd be on the Facebook pages. Like, oh, there's some kid selling selling cookies. Who is this? Have y'all seen this guy? They always blow people up on the Facebook in my neighborhood. So That's I can just imagine. There's car doors open. The, there's neighborhood kids. If they, would, if they would just shut it, this whole movie doesn't happen. But Biff goes back. He gives himself the almanac. And when they travel back to the future of 1985, they're in the alternate reality. And this is where we start playing with time travel. And this is probably like the moment in Back to the Future history that speaks like pop culture. This is no longer the first movie. This is alternate hell where Biff is Mecca Biff. And yeah, he has all the richest the, man in the, the world. Things and he's married his mom, killed his dad, all, all, all the thing. It's bad. And what I think is funny about this movie, and it's, Kind of reminds you like zombie movies. Like zombie movies, the start of a zombie show or movie is like, oh, the zombies are the problem. But by the end of the movie, it's not about the zombies. Yeah, it's it's about the people or the, the, the other challenges. Here it's like in a world where time travel exists, uh, the characters have a time machine at their disposal. They can, they can do whatever they want, but they're constantly confronted with not having enough time. They're constantly challenged like, you have 10 minutes to do this. You have this, that. And that's just like a really unique thing where I don't have a DeLorean. I don't have a time machine with a flux capacitor in the middle. I got a minivan uh, with, a, with a purple light. Much more dependable than the uh, DeLorean. Far more light. dependable and a lot more room. So that's good. But it's interesting to hear them talk about different things. And you think like, well, if I had a time machine, I could do things differently. Whereas I feel like part of this movie is positing that you don't need a time machine to to change time. The way you look at time doesn't have to be, you know, a certain way just because you have a time machine. Yeah, it's a overarching theme of the the trilogy, but essentially uh the time machine is is us in a way, so we have like our past which is like the stories of like how I first met your dad, like the the ingrained lessons that our parents have put into us. Uh and then we have like our natural uh traits that we take from our parents so like marty's shyness about his performance uh the different things we kind of fill in our dna uh, and then we always have that potential of our future they have the pictures to see what is my future going to look like uh, that they often refer to as like things either being erased or changed or all these things uh and the big meta message is essentially like you are the makeup of what the past stories were yep. the past problems and or how you're going to react in your current situation and move to the future with the time machine, Marty's character flaws, uh, which may seem small and, and minor situations are really exemplified and yep. turned up to 10 of like, Oh, it's so, it's so innocent to be like, Oh, I'm back here. Like, what does it hurt if I just take this almanac with me and like make a couple bits, you know, we just get a little bit more money. We just get a little richer. Yep, yep. Uh, but that, that greed that what that opens the door to those small decisions He's now seeing the ramifications of that instantly, uh, what it looks like 40, 50 years from yep, now, yep, instead yep. of like, oh, well, you know, I five think, minutes. you know, on a very similar but different note of like, part of what I took away from Back to the Future 2 is because he's talking about saving his child from Marty Jr. doing these bad things and, you know, him and Jennifer's life and how that impacted his parents. And we saw that in the first movie of part of adolescence and growing up is realizing that your parents where once where you are and that soon you will be where your parents are. And we're, we're kind of in the middle of that yep. where we're not old enough to have high school kids. Uh, we're not young enough to be in high school and we're kind of starting to think differently. And you're a human being after all, you know, this is going to be a human experience. So even though this is a movie about like time travel, I think it's really a, a movie about family, a movie about growing up 
a movie about taking responsibility, which is kind of ironic because then it turns into a Western. Uh, part three really picks up, you know, Doc gets zapped by a thing of lightning right at the end of two and gets zapped into the past, into 1885, uh, 75 years from that moment. And it's kind of just an interesting thing. I'm curious. I'm sure there are people at the, in the back l- listening to this thinking of what their favorites were. What did you think of like the Western take and that being such a different depart from the original first two seri- parts of the series? I think like post thought it is like the most logical place for them because we've gone a little bit in the past and a little bit in the future. We've seen so many things go to the future, but we've very rarely seen things go like to that time period. Like we've seen things go all the way back to like dinosaurs, but we haven't really seen like, okay, what do we, what do we do if we jump into your family's timeline, you know, a hundred years ago. Uh, But I think it's a fun, very distinct departure. So you, you can really tell once you see scenes from this movie of like, oh, this is the third one and they're back in the Western. Uh, But I think it speaks so many Western themes, I think speak to the overall storylines of this movie uh, and this franchise. And so it's a, a perfect landing spot i think for the third film uh for me it the story doesn't hold up as well as the first two in my opinion but i don't think that that has anything to do with the setting i think it has a lot more to do with maybe having seen two uh, they've done the movie two times now and we've seen a lot of the repeated things which works really well in the first one and then again in the second one by the time you get to the third one sometimes it can feel a little like all right i've kind of seen this yeah yeah so I I think I disagree with you oh, okay. pretty heavily. So I actually, going into this new rewatch, I always thought that I disliked this one the most. Uh, after having watched it again three days in a row, I think this is, this is, without this movie, the trilogy is not good. This is obviously it would be a trilogy, yeah. uh, but without this movie specific, like if they if they go to like feudal times and they're in a castle, or if they yeah. go to further into the future with Planet of the Apes and like that, without that, this is not as as good of a movie. And the reason why is because it gives Doc an opportunity to shine as a character. We get to see him change. Where really the roles change. Where in the past it's been Doc trying to save Marty. Uh, here Marty goes back to save Doc. And we see some really interesting things with him and Clara. He was supposed to pick her up at the train. He forgets, ends up saving her from falling off the cliff. And he, she says, like, oh, I suppose it was destiny. And that was, like, the first thing that clicked into me, reminded me of Interstellar, where oh, kind yeah, of yeah. reminds you, like, the one thing that goes across time and different dimensions is, is love. love. And some things just go beyond time. And I mentioned you earlier, Doc is so manic. He's so obsessive. He's so this... Precisely, precisely, Excelsior, great Scott. Like, things get on his nerves that shouldn't. But love doesn't get on his nerves. Love interrupts all those things, and he's now finally willing to, like, really change the rules. Well, and it's he's the first really time willing he's experienced it, yep. because you see, like, Marty's uh, main reason that he wants to get back in the first film is because, he, I can't stay here, I gotta get back to my girl, yep. which Doc doesn't really understand. Uh, and then you get to do you do get to see that. And I, while I did say that about the third one, it still ranks pretty high in like an overall movie ranking. It's not that I don't like the third yep. one. It's just of the three, in my opinion. But I do. I mean, I still enjoy it. it it's still a good movie. I think it's a good movie. Uh, I think it's an important installment because you get a lot of the stuff that paid off, like the elements of pride for both characters in the first two films, really start to be paid off and challenged here. Where Doc has believed his whole life, science is the way. But in this movie, he starts to realize maybe there's more to feeling in yeah, life. Yeah, the emotions, I have to, the heart. I have to lead with my heart, not just my head. And then on the flip side, Marty's pride is challenging. I can't lead with my heart. I need to take a step back and allow my head to think logically. And it it's really juxtaposed well with Seamus, his like great-great-grandfather, uh, who has conversation played by Michael J. Fox, and they're just talking back and forth where he gets a chance to talk face-to-face with them and say, look, you could have just walked away. There's no reason to have done all that. Yeah, and begin to shoot out. A- a- as you think about, like, your your legacy and what it means to be, you know, more... You are the product of generations of your family. And to think that Seamus K. 
came over from Ireland, moved to Hill Valley, and has William, Marty's great grandfather. They went through so much struggle and sacrifice just for you to be a hothead. Like just for you to get mad at anybody that says this. Like you're anybody that calls you a chicken. You're or, you know. you're not this, you're not that. You are who you are. And you can be more mature than that. And it's not often that you get the chance to look yourself in the eye and say that. Uh, but again, the musical score, there's that part where they're in the bar uh, towards the end of the movie and Mad Dog is calling out Marty. Come out of here, Clint Eastwood, you yellow belly turd. Yeah, you'll be the biggest yellow belly uh, in all the like, West. Uh, you can see him and Seamus looking at each other, the score. And you can see that he's really thinking, like, wow, I'm staring myself in the face. Am I going to be gutless? And everyone's telling him, you're a coward, except Seamus. And these are the people that have sacrificed for you. They're the one. He's the one that's counting on you. Yeah. And I thought that was just kind of a, a really interesting thing to, like, like legacy. Of We're never going to get to sit in front of our great-great-grandfathers and see what they struggled and went through. But here you know that Seamus was ridiculed for his hat, for his accent, for his clothes. He looks funky. He doesn't let that bother him. Yep. And you'll be better because of that. So it's like it's like almost like the opposite of Marty's dad, where he's like he's a pushover and lets people bully him and it really affects him. Yep. Whereas like his great grandfather, great great grandfather is just like, Meh, who cares? Yep. Like I'm over here, I'm providing for my family, I'm doing my thing. Like we traveled all the way, you know, thousands of miles and hours and oversea uh, to provide a better life. Like yep. I don't, you can call me whatever you want to. And and that pays off big because once they do the huge train, uh, what's the word? The, the train sequence where they're going back to 18, 1985 to get the train up to eight to 88 miles an hour. Uh, they obviously get back to 1885. Jennifer and Marty are in the truck going to see the DeLorean wreckage. And here we are. We, as the audience, know this is the race that ruined Marty's life that they talked about in Back to the Future 2. This is the race. Jennifer knows it, but Marty doesn't know it. We know it as a dramatic irony. Jennifer's panicked about, like, oh, this is where it all happens. This is where it all happens. He goes into reverse, which I still think is kind of weird. Why not just just stay stay there? there, Whatever. Uh but I guess it's part of us as the audience trying to trick us thinking like he still believes, but he's changed. And that's the moment that his future changes. So it's kind of cool to see that, you know, George tried to impart wisdom on Marty. It didn't work. Doc tried to impart some wisdom on Marty. It didn't work. Seamus, this great grandfather, great, great grandfather that was also like George, a pushover, but it didn't change like his identity of who he was. That's the one that changes him. He's like, oh, I would have hit that Rolls Royce. And so I think the the question I have for you, what do you think the purpose of like this trilogy is? What's like what is the the the, the main story of the trilogy? I think the main story is to be aware of where you've come from, all the things that have kind of built you up there, but then still as you go forward realizing that your future isn't set in stone. Mm-hmm you can still make those right decisions and kind of shape where you want to be going forward. And so thematically we talked about some of the themes that stand out in some of the individual parts. Do you walk away from this trilogy looking like, Oh, this is what this was about. This was the theme that really spoke or resonated with you most. I think, you know, love is a, as a big important factor. We get that payoff with doc Brown when he finally sees what it's like to have a family, to have love, uh, Marty's obviously always trying to get back to uh, Jennifer to be with her, his love, and then uh, Marty's parents actually loving each other after uh, yep. they they get to meet th- with that punch and kiss as opposed to Peep and Tom and Carr, and she's just kind of like suckered into being in love with him the rest of her life. And Yeah. So let me ask you this. Uh, this is obviously a time travel movie. Uh where do you think, you know, are there other time travel movies that this really reminds you of or other things you think, oh, if you like this time travel movie, you gotta, you got to check out this one? So I think that the, the thing that makes it beautiful about these films is that, like, since it's the backdrop and they don't focus too much on, like, 
the rules and like there's so much of time travel movies now is like okay we've established our rules this is what we're sticking with in our universe uh, going forward time travel is there and it kind of it makes sense it's very simplified in this uh, is it the most realistic i don't know i'm not a physicist but it <laughs> it works really well uh and i think something that like if you if you enjoy the this this style and this humor uh rick and morty is streaming on um hbo max which soon to be max and they have a ton of references to this movie in fact the two main characters are yep. set up uh morty instead of marty uh, and then the doctor are the inspiration for this uh it is a crude more crude show so it's, don't it's watch much it. much more yeah, aggressive don't, don't watch it with your not kids campy. it's not for children <laughs> it's not campy uh, at but all. it is some heady stuff they do have several time travel episodes that like pull in ties from this and then of course the two main characters are yep. brought by this these these adventures what about this i know that we we're talking about this before the show started uh just yesterday on twitter the day before we started recording this the reason we wanted to talk about this is because of the trilogy nature. We had watched Guardians. We wanted to talk about this. We wanted to talk about this. I'm curious. Yesterday, Christopher Lloyd says he'd be interested in doing a sequel, a, a Back to the Future 4. Michael J. Fox says he's not really interested. We also know just from his dealing with Parkinson's, he's not really capable of doing that yeah i think he's retired what are acting. what's your appetite for a sequel are you interested do you, do you want to see a, a, a reboot a remake like what 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 are your thoughts on any of that because it's so on point to be like oh top gun was good let's make top gun maverick oh ghostbusters was good let's do this 80s franchise yeah. was good let's reboot it now so i think i'm completely opposed to a reboot i do not want to see the brand new this is new marty this is new art yeah this is new marty this is new doc we're doing the story again but you know with fresh faces yeah. i don't want to see that if you have a sequel that's written well christopher lloyd comes back maybe you do like marty's son because mike won't be back in a movie more than likely and the script's good I'd watch it, but you do not need to remake these movies. They still hold up very well. There's a f very few like visuals that hold it back a little bit, but it's like so minor that it's it's not an issue at all because it's the the comedy still holds up. There's a few moments that maybe are a little more cringy than would have been when it came out, but yeah. it's like completely fine because it works within the whole realm. What are, yep. what are your thoughts on it? Or would you be open to it? So, I have some I have some like van fiction for okay. you. So. For those of you on the show, Van Fiction is where we kind of go into our theories about what could or what might be. And I've got a couple like weird ones. So I I tend to agree with you that like, yeah, I don't really want to, I'm not super interested in seeing this rebooted or remade. I will tell you this, if they did it, I would watch it. I'd probably go watch it on opening night. I do think it would be cool to see a movie done while this one's a little more campy and takes itself less serious, it would be really cool to see a movie done where like the special effects are really good the entire yeah. time. But I also agree with you that it, it's not to the fault of this specific film. Uh, that said, I have some theories about this. And in Michael J. Fox's quote, he says, like, what questions are left unanswered? We don't need to go back there because there's not really a story to be told because we get that. Like the way that it ended is perfect. I love when doc is saying to Jennifer, you know, your, your future hasn't been written. Neither of yours have. So go out there and make it a good one. Like that's such a perfect ending. That is where it should end. So if that's the ending, and I think it's a good ending, maybe there's an opportunity for a prequel. And Typically, we think like prequels, like oh, prequels suck because we gotta go to Star Wars and yeah. But this is a prequel of a time travel story, so the prequel doesn't have to be before 1885 or 1955. Uh, this prequel could be anywhere. And there's one question that I have in this movie after watching it all, and that is this: How did Rick and Marty? Uh, how how did how did how did Doc and Marty meet? Okay. So I do know that they did a comic so th book. So they did a comic book, which doesn't have to be canon for, for my theory that I'm about to okay. present to you. 
I have a very weird thought to think about the way that time travel happens in this movie. So think about like the gray sports almanac, right? So the moment that Biff bets on a race and wins, well, he has effectively changed the outcome of the future, right? So he's now changed the future. So the future, the sports and games might be different because he's now known as like this big better. He's changed it. But the asset, the, the gray sports almanac, is like a picture of the gravestone yeah, so of the kids. So it. it'll it'll change with it, right? It's the physical asset from the future, so it's always always changing. So Biff wouldn't know it at the time. So in the same sense, as Doc is traveling through time when he talks because he says he's traveled, and the very first movie he says, like, oh my my clocks are all twenty five minutes behind. It worked, it worked. Uh, he says he invented time travel in nineteen fifty five. Uh, he gets stuck in all these different places. What if this isn't the first time that he's time traveled? What if the reason that he found Marty is very intentional and very practical? Because like, what if this is weird? What if Marty and Doc are like the same person? That would be an interesting story. <laughs> so, I, have, I haven't seen so, that one in my hours so, so, of video So think watching. about this. Think about this. How many times does Marty go to a new time and he pretends to be somebody else? Oh, I'm Calvin Klein. I'm Clint Eastwood. I'm this. I have to become a character. And it's kind of a joke in the movie. Like, hey, who? Hey, you, McFly. And he's like, what are you? Oh, yeah, it's not me. He's talking to the other McFly that's here. He, like, forgets who he is. So, like, as he w- would travel and go through time linearly beyond the end of the story that we know... Uh, he would get better at this, at like becoming this person. So, I told you that I think that Doc gets really like manic and very precise. He's very much this. Well, that would line up with a scientist, but it also line up with a crazy person, and that happens a lot to actors who have like I'm going to become this person. I'm Heath Ledger. I'm going to be the Joker for six weeks, and that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to be the Joker. It's I'm that's how I'm going to portray this role. Well, Marty becomes really realized that no, I I could mess with the with the time I've I've learned that experience I'm going to be very strict about how I do this I'm just going to be this person that could become some like DID dissociative identity disorder uh and then as the future grows up he grows up into a to be Doc Brown Doc goes back to 1955 hits his head and he gets stuck there ah but know keep in mind, Marty. Uh, M- to Doc Brown, he's he ends up meeting Marty because it's a loop. Uh, he meets Marty when Marty shows up at his door. So in his mind, in Doc Brown's mind, Marty's the kid that showed up at his door that knew him that invented the time machine, and he had to get him back to the future. So he's always known him. So in that loop, Doc has to go like. From 1955 to 1980s or whenever he meets before the, the first movie starts, Doc has always known who Mar- Marty is. So he just seeks him out, just like natural. Yeah. And because of that, these experiences, you'd have to work on like the details specifically because there would be some like questions there. But imagine a, a, a prequel that is old Christopher Lloyd and like the, the dream casting of like a Tom Holland type character that we find out that they're the same. I check it out. Like it, I think it could be really cool. And here's where I think this is this is where like it, it plays out. In Rick and Morty, the show, which is a, a really fun fun show, we see a lot of like Rick allowing you know, like versions of Morty to die, where we see like oh he let this thing happen or like versions of him die. And it's very crude, but it makes fun of that. Well. What if this version of the story that we were seeing? Because again, there's two there's two timelines you're dealing with. There's a linear timeline of 12 days. It starts on October 25th, 1985. That night, he goes to the to Pine, Twin Pine Mall, travels back to 1955. He's there for a week, comes home. He's there for an hour, gets sent to 2015. That same day, travels back to November 12th, 1955. Doc gets zapped. Then he goes back to 1885 for four days. Then he comes back to present day 1985. So it's 135 years 
But for Marty, it happens in 12 days. Yeah. So it could be a, that's, it's, it's plausible that one, that could just be like a really traumatic event in itself to, to Marty. But also it's plausible that was like a speed run, like when you're playing Super Mario Brothers, where you you die so many times, you eventually figure out the, the tricks. So what if someone like Doc is pulling the strings and like allowing different versions of Marty to die uh, in different things? Because it's always so convenient that Doc shows up like at the right time to save him from this or save him from that, shoot the rope, pull a rope down, like... What if Doc was like live die repeat Tom Cruise? <laughs> he's and, like, done this a million. He's times. done this a million times. We're just seeing the one run that like he's already done it all because we're seeing it from Marty's perspective. He's been in a probability storm. Oh yeah, yeah. Something, something, something like that. I think that there's there's something to be said about that because if you think about like part one, part two, part three, especially at part three, like Doc needed Clara on the train to hear about his story. So that she would get off the t- train, stop the train, and that gives them enough time to deal with like the getting shot thing. That was like a very unique thing that only happened in that like version yeah, that, of that time. And this is like the speed run, very much like Edge of Tomorrow, Live Die Repeat. And I think of like that headstone there. He needed that headstone to get broken. So he needed this specific way to, to for it to go down. So he's kind of playing the, the the puppet master. So he's like the Doctor Strange in this story. Yeah, I'm just he's saying the, he's like a Time Lord. Yeah. You know, he, he's there's something there, and so that makes me think if you were to explore some of those types of things in a prequel, where you give true, true like it's it's not like a oh we're doing a new story a new thing where it feels like part of the original it, like it was always meant to be that to me speak and the one question that lingers is how did they meet. So if you can find a really compelling answer to that question and find a really cool visual and like emotional way to tell that story, I think it could be really cool. You know, Marty is very much driven by his impulses and his love. The doc is not. And in three, we see that kind of switch a little bit. What if that was like a reminder, a restoration of Marty to like who he really was? Uh, Again, there's probably plenty of holes in that theory. Uh, but as I was thinking more and more about it, I was like, that's the question that I, I, I wonder. And script is king. So in any of these situations, if they have a script like you, like what, what you described and that comes organically from the creator and it's not a, well, we want to make money, so let's just do it. And then yep. you write it post and who knows, you know, the, the, the heart isn't there like it was in the first three. That'll be easily, uh, distinguishable by yep. the by the fans and, and there's the big part in like the mandalorian season three where uh, chris lloyd's character's there and they talk about, like there's the, the the meme on the internet where they talk about how in back to the future three the very end marty's like hey you are you going back to the future and doc's like i've already been there um, i'm going somewhere else i've been there done that like what if he went to a f- time way back in the past to a galaxy far far away and the man and the man delorean started like the the religion of the mandalorians uh, which is like star wars and all that just like there's so much like potential t- in my eyes to where like we know that this isn't the only time travel that doc brown did yeah doc brown did other time travel so what are the extrapolations from that and i I, the more and more I think about it, I just tend to think like there's a connection here. What is the connection? I I, I tend to think I I think that I think that Doc is old Marty. Doc is Marty. You've got me convinced. That's that's all right. right. Write your script. Let's send yeah. it in. So I, in that sense, when you say like I I kind of am interested in, in a sequel. I think it's a prequel to figure out how Marty gets it. that way. The end is still hey, the it can do whatever you make it. But it's one of those things where you watch it and it's almost more, it brings more weight to the fact that Doc falls in love with Clara, that he saves himself, like Marty saves him and that's it. So you don't have to worry about like the, the you know, Michael J. Fox not being there and, and whatnot. And also the, like taken away from the true ending yeah, yeah, yeah. of like, you don't damage what you've already made. Yep. So I guess that, that leads us to the last thoughts of, you know, what did you rank this film? Or 
Um, let's take. Let's do this differently. Let's not rank the film. Give me your ratings of the movies, and then what would you rank the trilogy? At, opposed to other trilogies. Yeah, it's like how do I? How does it? Okay. What rank your order of the of the movies best to worst, and then uh, what do you? How do you feel about the trilogy? So whole? mine actually goes in uh, release order. My rankings. So the first one to me is a nine. Uh, I think it's an awesome movie. Still holds up very well. Uh, there's some like minor issues, but nothing that like changes much for me. Uh, number two is eight point five. It's right there on par. There's just a couple of things that didn't work for me. Uh, and then number three, which I said was my least favorite, is still to me a seven point five. Very good movie. A lot, a lot I like about it. Uh, and as a whole, when you put those three movies together, uh, I think it holds up well against any trilogy. Uh, I think I really have to put it probably top three, uh, top three to four trilogies overall. I think if it's not in your top five trilogies uh, and you have any, you're any fandom of a sci-fi, I think you lose credibility. So yep, yep, yep. So going into this rewatch, my favorites were in order two, one, and three. After having done this rewatch and thought a lot about the story, because keep in mind, like my, my thought is, I think the, the purpose of this trilogy is all about Doc helping Marty break his pride. So from the very beginning, in the first one, he teaches Marty about time travel. The second one, he starts to work on his pride. The third one, he breaks him from his pride. And finally, in the end, he avoids the Rolls Royce. So like in my like, if Doc Brown is a Time Lord and they are the same, maybe he need, he realized like, I need to go back to my my younger self and break myself of this specific tendency. I need to break myself of my pride because that's my worst attribute. Uh, maybe that's why he specifically sought out Marty. But in any case, regardless of the theory, that to me is the story of the, the three movies, is breaking Marty of this arrogance, this ego, this pride, whatever that is. That is the story. And... As a result, I walk away from this movie thinking that the trilogy, I think I think three is the best one. Mm-hmm. I think one is the second best one, and I think two is is the worst. And I say worst. I just I went in thinking it was two one three. I walked out three one two. They just everything inversed because the emotional arc is what's there the and again I'm watching them all like back to back to back as if they're one big movie because they're part one, part two, part three. I always thought of them as one, two, and three. Two, the ending of the story doesn't really like pacify me. It's not as satisfying. I want there to be more of a story de- de- delivered and then move on. It kind of feels like a lot of movies that like, hey, let's do a trilogy, but like the last one we're going to do it in two parts. So it's really four movies. Yeah. Uh, this one feels to me like they could have cut some things out and done two and three as one movie. And that is like a really, really strong asset that tells a really big story and travels a whole lot of time. It's a really compelling story. So for me, all in all, I I really like this trilogy. I love that it is very simple on the surface, but also very, very deep. We're talking about a movie that has a lot of the same gags, a lot of the same tropes and stereotypes. It's goofy. But at the same time, we're talking about really deep philosophic discussions of are you in control of your destiny? Uh, do you respect your parents? Can you empathize with others? Those are things that really, really do matter. So there, there's something for everybody in this movie, in the trilogies. So for me, I did not rank the individual movies. I just ranked 312. Uh, but for the trilogy, I give this a, a solid 9.2 okay. because there are other trilogies I think that execute on certain elements a little bit better but cohesively I give this a lot of credit for originality for directorial vision staying to their guns and doing something that had really never been done before Uh, a connected series of different types of things and it's just it's just really well done rewatching this I reminded myself of how much I love this series yeah I, I can't wait 
a few more years, I'm going to watch this with Gibson and, yep. and show him. And I'm sure that he's going to love it. There's so many things I can already tell that would be just, just fun moments. And like you said, those repeated things that it does throughout the, the individual movies. And then the trilogy uh, really brings the audience back in. So you feel like you're a part of the jokes, uh, which works really well for the, the longevity that this franchise has had uh, in the trilogy. So it, it, it breeds for an awesome time and a lot of rewatchability. Uh, and, you know, streaming services, as they look for ways to keep audiences engaged, it's a perfect uh, way to do it. You can find the trilogy on Tubi. Uh, it's free. It's a, a free, free account. You can sign up. I I was, like, not wanting to make one for several days because I was like, I don't want to pay for something. Uh, but you don't have to pay for anything. You just make I didn't account. even sign up. I just logged into yeah. the app. On I chose the app on my smart TV. It just doesn't save your progress. Yeah, that's so just the watch the whole movie. yeah, you can watch it. There's just a couple commercials, but it's super. It doesn't cut out any of the movie during the commercials. It just you have to watch, you know, two minutes, and it works out well. I really like the trilogy. I think you 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 need to go see it. Uh, and on that note, if you're sitting here watching, what did you think of the trilogy? What, what what do you think? What are your best moments? What do you think of the rankings? Do you like one the best? There's a lot of people that love one. Number two is super beloved. I think number three gets a lot of flack just because it was such a departing from the original story. But watching them all three together, it really anchored the trilogy for me, especially emotionally. I really, really loved it. Uh, but that's going to bring us to the end of our show as we yep. kind of park on the train tracks. Uh, it's been a good one. Yep. And in the words of, of Doc Brown, your future has not been written yet. So go out and, and make it a good one. But do buckle up. We'll see you next time on the Minivan Movie. Let's go!